This is really a, a great honour um, to welcome as our speaker today, Lord McFall of Alcluis, the Lord Speaker of the, the House of Lords. Lord McFall has served as Lord Speaker since 2021 and has had a long-standing interest in constitutional affairs. Before moving to the Lords, he was a, a Labour Member of Parliament from 1987 to 2010, first for Dumbarton and then from 2005 for West Dumbartonshire, during which time he served with great distinction as Chairman of the House of Commons Treasury Committee. Lord McFall's career is in a sense a case study in the value of education in widening horizons and um, seeking new opportunities. After leaving school without any qualifications at the age of 15, Lord McFall worked for a time in the local, local parts department in Dumbarton and then in a factory. Before resuming his studies at Paisley College of Technology for a BSc in Chemistry. In order to broaden his horizons um, and his knowledge, he then obtained a BA from the Open University in Education and Philosophy and then became a um, chemistry and maths teacher before becoming a deputy head in Glasgow um, and embarking on what turned out to be a, a very um, uh, distinguished career in, in national politics. The title of Lord McFall's talk today is Beyond Westminster, a second chamber for the whole country. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Lord McFall. Joram and Louise, thank you very much for this invitation. I'm delighted to be here in Manchester speaking to you tonight. Now, many of you are doubtless here because of your interest in politics. I've worked in both Houses of Parliament, as Joram said, for almost 40 years. So I hope to be able to give you some insight into what it's like this evening. However, as mentioned, I didn't start out looking for a career in politics. As I left school early, as been indicated, and I studied for a range of qualifications in my early 20s, as they say, becoming a chemistry teacher and a deputy head. But after involvement in my local Labour Party branch, I was selected as candidate for Dumbarton in 1987 for the Labour Party and served 23 years in the Commons. But once a teacher, always a teacher. The University of Manchester is the birthplace of modern computing and nuclear physics and the home of Ernest Rutherford, whose pioneering work led to the splitting of the atom. Eventually, Rutherford was appointed to the House of Lords, making him part of a rich tradition of scientific expertise within the Lords Chamber, which remains to this day. Manchester has not only had a huge impact on the scientific community, but also in our constitutional progress. In the 19th century, this place was the nexus of the Industrial Revolution, a focal point for political radicalism, free trade and intellectual endeavour. Some of the vital moments in the development of our parliamentary democracy were played out, as we know, just moments from where we are speaking today. And constituencies within Greater Manchester have played host to great figures in our political history, including Balfour and Churchill. But tonight, I want to focus on a subject close to my heart, the importance of Westminster reaching out to all parts of the United Kingdom. I'm all too keenly aware that Westminster can be seen as an institution that is distant from local needs. Every weekend, after a busy time in Westminster, I still return home to the place where I grew up in Scotland and still live there. When I was first elected as MP, my friends questioned why I wanted to go to London, given a successful career in education. And in fact, they said to me, you must be off your head. And as they say in Scotland, you must be off your head. But nearly 40 years later, I'm glad to say that I've kept my head. But the experience that I've gained between Scotland and London has reinforced more firmly my belief that the social, 
economic and political traditions and life of our country do not and should not exist solely in London and the South East, but extend across the whole of the United Kingdom. Now, a lot of people speak about reform in Westminster. Across our political system, I believe there's a need to improve the balance between North and South, centre and periphery, London and the regions, and how to do this is another question. I now represent the House of Lords. So what role could we play in restoring the balance? First, let's remind ourselves about the role of the House and then consider how it might help in this respect. The press tend to focus on the flaws of a few of our members and some of the quirkier traditions. Unfortunately, there is a limited, wider understanding of what we actually do. I believe our work, our composition, and our outputs are complementary to the House of Commons and thereby assist democracy. Let's say MPs are the university students and the bills that they send to the House of Lords are, are the essays. And what we do is provide a peer review marking the homework. So we scrub the bills up and give it a, a clean face, as we say. And for that reason, any reform could impact these carefully balanced arrangements and should therefore be considered carefully. But I will come on to that later. But let me give you examples of our work, then briefly talk about the benefits of our composition. The main role of the Lords is to check every new draft law proposed by the government, line by line, investigating every implication and considering the consequences of every clause. About 60% of our time is spent on this, and unlike in the Commons, all changes proposed by members can be debated when considering a bill. The Commons simply don't have the time to do this. MPs are focused on constituency work, party campaigning, and these days, social media. But time on campaigning and, and looking at the order paper is limited, and there is a certain cut-off point for debates, which is called a guillotine. But the House of Lords has no time limit when considering legislation. To take one example from the last session, the Lords considered over 1,200 changes to the Leveling Up and Regeneration Bill during 139 hours of scrutiny. As a result, the government made changes to the bill, including on climate change mitigations and adaptations in national development policies. In July last year, we completed our examination of the online safety bill. The government accepted several changes to the bill originally put forward by Lords members on topics including AI-generated content, age verification to prevent children accessing inappropriate content, disclosure of information held by service providers, and Ofcom guidance on protecting women. As well as the scrutiny of laws, our select committees are renowned for their detailed analysis of evidence, their expert membership, and the depth of their inquiries. Whilst common committees focus on the work of government departments, Lord's inquiries are free to examine the pressing issues of the day, whilst also looking at the long-term complex challenges facing our society. For example, our digital committee recently urged the UK not to miss out on the potential of AI gold rush that could be delivered by large language models like ChatGBT. 
Our Environment Committee focused on the need for more government investment in electric vehicle charging. And we have recently established a new committee to scrutinise financial services regulators, such as the Financial Conduct Authority, which have grown in importance in recent years, particularly since the financial crisis. So the atmosphere in which this work is undertaken also matters. Since the 2008 financial crisis, we have seen an increase in what I call the three Ps. Polarisation, post-truth and populism. And this has been exacerbated by the fallout from Brexit, Covid and resurgent violence in Europe and the Middle East. And against this background, it's vital that our parliamentary institutions avoid resorting to populism, which is offering easy answers that we know do not work. Post-truth, ignoring difficult evidence when it does not fit our preconceptions. And polarisation, setting interest groups against one another. Now, as we know, the House of Commons can be a boisterous place, particularly during PMQs, and we had evidence of that very recently. But in the House of Lords, you rarely hear a voice raised. Our debates are characterised by courtesy and respect for all. And as a result, we often achieve consensus from all sides around amendments and changes to bills. When the Lords defeat the government in a vote, it's understandable that it grabs headlines. But our bigger impact comes from the amendments passed in the Lords with government approval. We see over a thousand or more of these every year. They often represent a minister listening to the concerns and objections raised by peers and revisiting the government's plans in response. And a recent study by the University uh, in London, University of London Constitution Unit, found that more than half of all the changes to bills originate in the Lords. Now, this process can be frustrating for ministers, and I know that having been a minister in the Labour government. But on reflection, many of them acknowledge that it helps highlight practical differences and prevents unintended consequences. The tone and the atmosphere of our proceedings is a result of our composition. So let me now consider that. We are appointed rather than elected, and this is both a strength and a weakness. So the legitimacy of our role in legislating for the nation will always be open to question. On the strengths of the system, it's helpful to quote what others say. In his recent book, How Westminster Works and Why It Doesn't, the commentator Ian Dunn says, and I quote, the Lords has two crucial advantages over the Commons, independence and expertise. That's why it is effective. In fact, he goes on to say that the Lords is the only part of Parliament that actually works. Most members of the House of Lords arrive having fulfilled many of their career ambitions and are therefore free to pursue their areas of expertise. In addition, the governing party has no majority in the upper house, so ministers must proceed by persuasion and consensus rather than the force of numbers. The government needs to win the support of our independent crossbenchers who comprise about a quarter of the House. And our benches are home to eminent figures from across the UK. Scientists, doctors, judges, business leaders, trade unionists, campaigners for civil liberties and disability rights, environmentalists, academics, and engineers. Now, their presence reflects the fact that the life of the nation does not reside 
only in formal political parties, but is also expressed through the diverse institutions and organisations. Consider the membership of the Science and Technology Committee. It is chaired by a professor of engineering. It includes the Astronomer Royal, a former director of the Royal Society of Biology, the former chief executive of the Environment Agency, and a former minister for security and a serving professor of biodiversity. The ability to draw on such expertise is a unique advantage of the appointment system. But there is a case for reform. There's a need to answer questions regarding the overall size of the House, which is approaching 800 members, and the methods of appointment to the House. Now, historically, grand schemes for radical reform of the Lords has failed. Conversely, incremental, smaller scale reforms, whether through the creation of life peers in 1958, the removal of most hereditary peers in 1999, or the introduction of retirement and expulsion measures 10 years ago, they have strengthened and reinforced the work of the House. There's therefore a strong case for examining what could be achieved by further incremental reform. How could reform help to make our politics less London-centric and ensure a UK-wide focus? The House of Lords, like the House of Commons, legislates not for Westminster or London or the South East, but for the whole of the United Kingdom. Our task as a scrutinising and a revising chamber is to ensure that legislation works well for all of the country. To demonstrate this, one of my first acts as Lord Speaker was to travel to the devolved parliaments and assemblies in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. <clears throat> and I established an inter-parliamentary forum to bring members of these institutions together with Westminster MPs and peers. And the aim to discuss our joint work and shared interests on an equal footing. The forum continues its work and this morning they had a meeting in Westminster which I addressed at the opening of the session. Our House also has members who have retained deep roots in their home areas. Here in the North West we have amongst others the Cumbrian broadcaster Melvin Bragg, the journalist John Bakewell from Stockport, the BBC Director General John Burt from Liverpool, and the former Stockport Council leader Dave Goddard. From Northern Ireland, we have Arlene Foster, former Unionist leader Reg Empey, and former STLP leader Margaret Ritchie. And in Scotland, we have Jack McConnell, who was the First Minister of Scotland, and Michael Forsyth, who was the Secretary of State, as well as Ruth Davidson, the former Conservative leader in Scotland. And we also have a number of members with strong links to Wales, Wales gained across all tiers of government and diverse areas of civil society. But we can do even more to enhance the reputation of the whole United Kingdom in Westminster and I'm open to the ideas for reform. But my watchword whenever reform is discussed is first seek to understand. Understand the work of the Lords and what it does and understand what impact any proposed change would have on that work. One proposal is to replace the House of Lords with an elected assembly of the nations and regions. Now, there are a number of models for regional chambers around the world, but it is far from clear whether any of them would work in the unique conditions of the United Kingdom, a union of four nations within one state. In Germany, which I visited a few weeks ago, the upper house 
is made up of delegations from each of the federal states, giving regional governments a say in decision-making at the national level. But the UK is not federal. We have parliaments and assemblies in Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast, elected mayors and combined authorities in cities like Manchester here and a variety of different tiers of council in other parts of the country. No system of rep uh, representation could fairly reflect that complexity. Some have argued that elected members could better represent the interests of the nations and regions in the second chamber. But we already have a House of Commons with representation from 650 constituencies covering every part of the United Kingdom. And their members vote along party lines rather than as regional groups. And there is nothing to suggest this would be different in an elected second chamber. Questions have to be asked if members of the upper house were to be elected by a region, how would seats be allocated between regions? If they were distributed by population size, there is no doubt that England, which comprises over 80% of the UK population, would dominate the new chamber. If we followed the example of the US Senate and shared out seats equally between region states, regardless of population, we would end up with a system in which sparsely inhabited areas wield disproportionate clout. And how would we draw the boundaries between regions? Would someone from Manchester feel that they were best represented by a senator for the North West, from Liverpool or Carlisle? An elected second chamber would also pose a challenge to a key strength of our current arrangements, namely that on the relatively rare occasions when the two houses disagree on legislation, it is clear to everyone which opinion should prevail. That is the elected House of Commons. Even if these issues were overcome, we could see Second Chamber of Parliament become an arena for divisive regional disagreements over resources, rather than a house dedicated to the task of improving the laws governing the whole of the United Kingdom. But this is the role that the House of Lords plays and which it does well. Incremental reforms could offer an opportunity to enhance the role of the Lords as UK White House, whilst protecting its valuable work and functions. The fact that the House of Lords is appointed could in fact make it easier to address disparities in regional representation, as well as any other disparities, including gender, ethnicity, or other characteristics. The House of Lords Appointments Commission, called HOLAC, was created in 2000 to increase the experience and expertise on the independent crossbenches. Since 2012, it has been limited by a letter of instruction by the then Prime Minister in the number of independent peers that it can propose for membership of the House. Might it be possible to release this constraint on HOLAC and perhaps give the Commission a renewed focus on monitoring regional imbalances and making representations to correct them? Other ideas are worthy of consideration as part of this debate, such as the proposals that place, places in the laws could be reserved for holders of particular regional posts such as elected mayors of our great cities. Could more be done to enhance transparency when making new appointments to the House of Lords? Think of New Year's honours lists in which knighthoods, CBEs and MBEs are awarded. In these lists, the city or region where the person comes from is always listed. That is not the case 
for the list of political appointments to the House of Lords, but perhaps it should be. If future lists of new peers were broken down into different nations and regions within the United Kingdom, it would encourage Prime Ministers to think about the overall geographical balance of their nominations to the House. This exercise in transparency could over time have a positive impact upon the composition and representative, representativeness of the Chamber. And my hope is that any Prime Minister considering reform of the House will seek to understand the strengths of our institution. They should also consider the impact of proposed changes on the work of the House and the potential for unintended consequences, including the loss of expertise and independence. Allow me to conclude with an illustration of what happens when people seek to understand the House. Earlier this week, Prospect magazine published an article by Bill Keller, who's a former editor of the New York Times. And he was giving an outsider's perspective on the House. Now, the headline of his article was A House of Ill Repute. Pretty, in his, in, uh, pretty condemning, should I say, in that. It didn't sound promising at all. And Mr. Keller begins by explaining that when given the assignment, his first thought was of the comic potential of the House of Lords. But he spent some time sitting in our press gallery, speaking to members and following our proceedings. And he found, and I quote, the discussions were sometimes absorbing like graduate seminars in which everyone has done their homework. Many of the speakers seemed to know what they were talking about and to listen to one another with genuine curiosity. I can assure you that the debate is rarely so constructive in either houses of Congress in the United States. His conclusion chimes with my earlier remarks regarding the need for the upper house to complement rather than challenge the House of Commons. And Mr Keller goes on, if a new government chooses to take on reform, the trick will be to preserve the strength of the House of Lords, the diversity of experience, the wariness of dogma, the ability to work across political boundaries, the devotion to the rule of law so that it complements the unhappy tribe in the commons without crippling it or, God forbid, replicating it. Wise words indeed, and I could not have put it better myself. The House of Lords will continue its work, and those who seek to change it should first seek to understand. Thank you. for what was a really fascinating talk and I think some of the arguments you put forward there will be very familiar to a lot of our students um, sitting here. Um, we do have a little bit of time for questions and I've got some student, eager students with microphones who would, would love to run up and down the steps so if you would like to ask a question can you give us a wave? Hi there. Um, what safeguards are in place for the appointment of lords that ensure that expertise is prioritised over political affiliations? Good. Any other? Will it take maybe two or three at a time? Um, I was just wondering in terms of the legitimacy of the House and with the potentially dubious nature of some of the political appointments where people don't seem to have any particular expertise or it's because the government at the time wants to uh, provide a ministerial job to somebody who's not an MP, for example, just off the top of my head. Um, does that risk, in your opinion, especially with the rise of populism and pandering, 
by the, the elected government, does that risk undermining the independence and the integrity of, of the Lords? Yeah, maybe the first point. Uh, I have no influence over who comes in the House of Lords. That's the Prime Minister's privilege. And it's been suggested in the House, not least from a former leader of the House, uh, Conservative leader, that say resignation honours lists, which Prime Ministers put forward, should be abolished. Because if a Prime Minister is putting in a member, an individual to the House of Lords, they should have some accountability for them. But if they're resigning, there is no accountability on that. In terms of independence as well, there's the issue of HOLAC, House of Lords Appointments uh, Commission. And there has been a groundswell in the Lords itself to ensure that it becomes more independent. I had uh, Canadian politicians across just last week, because I, I, I represent the House, I'm the face of the House, so uh, when they come across, you know, they, they visit me largely speaking. And they have a system whereby their appointments commission is independent. The uh, Prime Minister it doesn't have any influence on that. But it then goes to the Prime Minister for approval. And largely speaking, I'm told that the Prime Minister does that. But there's an independent element there. And when that was proposed to the House in a private member's bill recently, uh, it was approved without a vote, indicating that most members of the House uh, sign up to that. Also, my predecessor, Lord Fowler, he set up, in which I continue, a Lord Speaker's Committee. And we have 800 members, which people would say is far too many. Uh, and again, some would say <coughs> the number of members in the House of Lords should be less than the n number of members of Parliament. So. We have 60, 150 members of parliament, so maybe 600 or, or 500. And there was an effort to do that. And the aim was for every person who was come in the House of Lords, two would exit as a result. And Mrs May, the Prime Minister at the time, worked very positively with us on that. But recently, that figure has, sh has shot up uh, on it. But there is a need really to engage in that. And also the issue of ethnicity and diversity and getting across the UK. I come from what I would call the peripheries in Scotland, even further up than yourselves in Manchester. And I know uh, how people feel a bit alienated, isolated from the, the House of Lords. And therefore, when I did become Lord Speaker, as I said, the first thing I did was visit all the parliaments. Uh, visit them and speak to the, the speakers of the parliament and establish inter-parliamentary forum, uh, which is an informal body to discuss major issues. For example, the first uh, subject it, it looked at was Brexit and a lot of behind the scenes engagement in that uh, helped the legislation in, in Brexit. I was a minister of Northern Ireland uh, for, for quite a time and it was at the time of the, the peace process. I'd previously been engaged in a forum with Irish politicians. And at the time in the 1980s, largely speaking, we engaged with one another. We chatted with, uh, with one another. We'd eye to eye contact with one another. We'd a pint with one another in the evening. But when it came to the peace process, we knew each other. We had a feel for each other and a respect for each other as we went along. And that's the means, I think, about getting a more productive and respectful environment uh, for members of parliament. And when I addressed the Inter-Parliamentary Forum this morning, I said, everyone here is on the same basis. They're equal worth. There is no exceptionalism uh, of Westminster. And that is an issue that, that we have to get across in there. And when you talk about integrity, the House of Lords will always be, will always be criticised. But if there's a genuine attempt, attempt to, to make it independent, to work on the reduction of members, to ensure that across the country 
its representative of the United Kingdom, I think that could assist the, the process of increasing respect. But I'm always aware, as Lord Speaker, that there will always be criticism because we are unelected. So um, you spoke a lot of the, well, you spoke a little bit, uh, you spoke how like um, the House of Lords kind of marks the Commons homework in a way. Sorry, could you speak up a bit? Uh, so you spoke, oh, yeah, I wasn't on the microphone, sorry. Um, so you spoke uh, a bit about how the House of Lords kind of marks the homework of the Commons in a way. Now, um, I think, uh, do you think that that kind of uh, principle could be like extended a bit? Like maybe you could, you know, be whole, because like you're, it's gen generally a lot more impartial than the Commons. Do you think that maybe an extension of like those powers to hold the Commons to account could be like good for our democracy and good for our, you know, the running of the government in general? Good. Uh, another question? Oh, um, I was going to ask, thank you very much for your um, speech. It was really interesting. Um, I was going to say, um, do you think maybe part of the issue with the, with the Lords is that maybe it's the labeling of it as the Lords, as obviously in the UK, you talked about the North-South divide. We do have like a class issue as well. And I feel like okay. maybe the issue is that we call it the Lords and should it have like a different name? Does it need to be reformed? And is that part of the reason why people feel disillusioned with it? Sorry, if I could just get, uh, you're speaking about amendments. But, uh, as in like- Maybe speak closer to the microphone. As sorry. in because it's called- summarize. Yeah, summarise, Louise. What's, what's been asked is- Sorry about that. Is it the, the name, the House of Lords, that is the issue? Ah, right, got because you. Because it doesn't reflect its kind of class mm. divides as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. On that point, you're right. When I, be, when I uh, became a member of the House of Lords, uh, I went back home and a number of young people who lived near me uh, came up to me as I was cutting the grass in the garden. And one of them said, John, do we have to call you Lord? <laughs> to which his friend said, and if I could say it, don't be bloody daft. <laughs> so, no, I think it does give that impression. And one of the uh, aims that I have is to try and ensure that, quote, ordinary people exist in the Lords and we represent all strains throughout the United Kingdom. So that's one for uh, the box to question. So a good point. Now, you're talking about marking the homework and maybe strengthening the role of the, of the House of Lords. Sorry, over here. Uh, one thing the House of Lords does not do is it does not challenge money bills. In other words, it does not challenge any finance bill uh, coming through the Lords. So we don't give our opinion on the budget uh, as such in terms of influencing legislation. We can comment on it. Uh, and I think that's an important part because we have got to be, if you like, sufficiently humble in our approach. We are not elected. We do not have constituents. And when I was Member of Parliament, I felt that quite keenly uh, because I had two jobs. I had the job in my constituency and I had the job in Westminster. Scrutinised legislation in Westminster, uh, considering and trying to look after the interests of my constituents. And I always saw that as two equal purposes, which is very important. As members of the House of Lords, we don't have a constituency. <clears throat> but what I've said is that we could engage in a public discourse. And that's the aim of me coming up here, to talk to yourselves, to get that public discourse so that we understand each other. And though we disagree, uh, we've got to be, have agreeable disagreement. And we don't have that in the world at the moment, as I mentioned to you, with the three Ps. And I think that the House of Lords contributes to that. Being impartial, uh, but challenging the House of Lords, uh, sorry, House of Commons considerably. Uh, the the levelling up bill, which came before the House of Lords, uh, we examined it, and on day 10 of the bill, day 10, we had more amendments that day than we had in day one. 
So in other words, there was a forensic examination of, of that bill, which cannot take place in the, the House of Lords. So that's an example of us scrubbing up the legislation. Now we send it back to the House of Commons, and the House of Commons sends it back to us. We look at it again, and if they send it back to us, largely speaking, we say, that's it. In other words, scrub your face up, you go out. If you don't fancy getting your face scrubbed up anymore, well, you've made your decision, you lie in your bed. So that's what the House of Lords does in its relationship with it. But it's always got to be seen as the House of Commons having its way uh, in every occasion. Is there another couple? Yeah, yeah. Good evening, Lord McFall. Thank you very much for coming up this evening and uh, taking your time, time out to talk to us. Um, could I ask what we can do to further increase the amount of contribution from the Lords? We see pictures in the media of the chamber almost empty. You mentioned that there's 800 uh, members within the Lords, and, and very often people aren't there. We know that the Lords aren't paid to be there, so they've probably got other enterprises, jobs, or whatever that's distracting them from there. What reform can be done to increase participation uh, to ensure that we get this unelected expertise that's actually informing the laws that are being made? Uh, good, another one. Just take them. Hi, hi. Um, on what you said to the previous question, um, do you welcome ministers being in, in the House of Lords? Um, obviously, David Cameron's been appointed. Um, and he obviously doesn't have a constituency. So do you think it's better for a minister to not have those duties on top of their ministerial duties? Uh, you, you, you mean not being a member of the House of Lords? That's right, yeah. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> well, actually, David Cameron, in his position, is not the first one to come in. For example, Peter Mandelson was made a minister and was in the House of Lords. I sit on the Woolsack, the equivalent of the Speaker's chair, in the House of Commons. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm able to see the whole business in the House of Lords. And David Cameron, in fact, he's appeared next Tuesday, and he'll be taking four questions, substantial questions, for at least half an hour. His involvement in the House of Lords, I think, assists us in understanding the wider engagement. And our members uh, can engage with uh, Lord Cameron in a very informed way. Let me give you an example. There's a, an individual called Lord Kerr of Lin, Lin, Kinlochard. He was our representative EU ambassador in Europe. He was in America. He was a top-class diplomat. And when we had our discussion <coughs> on the uh, Brexit bill in Article 50, you remember Article 50, which uh, we had to give notice to the EU what, on the date when we were coming out on that. Discussion took place in the chamber on that particular issue, and there was a position from one person, a position from the other, until Lord Kerr <coughs> stood up and he said, Article 50, he says, I know all about that. Why? Because I wrote it. Right? And by the way, I wrote it with this pen. So that's the level uh, of expertise that, that's there in the House of Lords. And the point about the Lords, it's unelected chamber. If individuals <coughs> do not come to the chamber, do not attend the House of Lords, they don't get any allowance for it. And what I've said to members, distinguished members, when they come and see me, and I see quite a lot of them as they come into the the House of Lords, because I feel it's a duty of mine. Uh, I'm the only elected person in the House of Lords, elected by the whole uh, House. My accountability, like my, uh, being an MP in constituents, is to each member. And I say to them, come in as and when you want, but when you do come in, ensure that your expertise is used and you can contribute to particular debates. And that's how I see the House of Lords functioning on that issue. It's unelected. Uh, they don't need to come at all times. When they come, bring us their, their expertise on that. Uh, 
so the challenge, maybe the last thing I would say, is that participation does take place in, in the House of Lords. Average every day, there's about 420 to 450 individuals coming along. And as I've indicated to you, with 139 hours, there's a, a core of hard-working individuals in the House of Lords. And not only in the chamber do we indulge in that business and deep scrutiny, but we have our committee system, which as I would describe as got a Gulliver approach. In other words, it's got a wide remit on that. And I know that, again, I was talking to in the, uh, the EU partnership, EU-UK partnership for Europe, and every report which the House of Lords undertakes ends up in Europe and were commended by the commissioners and others in Europe for the quality and the depth of that particular report. So that's the function of the Lords. Any others? Another two? <clears throat> so one of the strengths you've drawn upon of the House of Lords is the level of expertise the members have to amend and um, change bills, well, not change bills legally, but suggest change of bills. Is, does that not highlight a weakness of the House of Colum Commons? And if you look at past PMs and such, there is a lot of people who are entrenched and have been since graduation, for example, entrenched in party politics. What can we do as a broader question to draw in people with career experience into the legislative function of the Commons as a whole? How can we move people and break people from rigid party boundaries and therefore have more expertise on bills? And I'm not saying that will take away from the House of Lords, but have the homework you get to mark be the best and most informed version it can be. Sure. Another one? Um, hi. I was just, because you talked mm. about representation in the House of Lords. Uh, do you think that the House of Lords could ever be like truly representative with, I think, 26 members being bishops from the Church of England? Do you not think that maybe some of them should be maybe ejected and it shouldn't be as, it should be more representative of minorities from religions and just from ethnic minorities as well? Yeah. <coughs> Maybe I could start with the first question about party politics and scrutiny. A lot of the engagement in the House of Lords is about party politics on the floor of the House. But behind the scenes there, there's a lot of really good work cross-party taking place. <coughs> I was chairman of the Treasury Committee, the Finance Committee, for 10 years. <coughs> and uh, we worked closely with the opposition. My job as chairman of the committee was to ensure that all members of my committee had the opportunity to give their point of view and to engage. But what I said to them at all times was, look, we must do this and come together to provide a unanimous report. Because if we don't do that, when a report goes out, it will say the Labour Party report, the majority have produced this, or the minority have stopped that. And I was on a television programme one night with my opposite number on the committee, whom I'll not name, but we were, I think it was debating a news night or something like that. And when I came off that, I said to him, look, I'm not going to be debating with you again on television. Why is that? I said, because we have got to give uh, a uniform face to the, com the, the public so that the integrity of our engagement in the committee with the floor of the house, with the general public is maintained. And during my 10 years, we had unanimous reports on all occasions. 
Now, that doesn't mean to say it was easy, because uh, I was chairman at the time of the financial crisis. So we would meet, and I remember one occasion, over one sentence, we had a two and a half hour debate. <laughs> so there's a lot of hard work that goes into it, but that unanimity is important. And a number of the committees in the House of Commons you know, show that. But for the public, uh, Prime Minister's questions can be a bit off-putting. But for MPs, <coughs> mindful of the responsibility they have to their constituents, then it's always good to get your voice in uh, f for your constituency. So when you're looking at Prime Minister's questions, that's not the whole thing. There's work that goes on behind this, the scenes as well. But I would call it theatre. Uh, we engage in theatre for half an hour uh, every week on that. The other aspect about representation, well, I mentioned I want a wider constituency throughout the whole United Kingdom. And somebody mentioned the bishops. <coughs> I would actually like to see more uh, representation from different faiths. And I think we have the Anglican bishops at the moment, 26. Uh, we have uh, a Sikh, uh, Lord Ahmad, uh, from uh, today, and we have Methodists in. And I, I think we need a wider engagement. Now, when I went into the House of Lords, I thought, well, look at the bishops there. What can they contribute? The problem with society today, in the disorder in society, and the negative appreciation of the political process is driven because people don't feel that their interests have been served and it's an alien institution in Westminster across the whole of the political divide. But for me, the bishops assist the process quite well. Why? Because they reside in their communities and they can give an expert element to the debate in the House of Lords. The Bishop of Durham is just retired and he was in to see me yesterday. He said a lifelong <coughs> interest in children and children's services. And at the time of COVID, he set up the equivalent of Warham's Home where the church halls were open for people to come by. Now, largely speaking, MPs wouldn't do that because they don't have the time for that. But that was his expertise and, and what he was put forward. Other bishops have got an interest in refugees and you've probably seen the controversy with the Church of England and the government on that. But these bishops are very, very uh, strong in ensuring that the welfare of refugees and the respect we have for them is put over in the house. So they do provide that diversity. But I said reform is very important. And perhaps in the reform with the size of the house, then there could be a reduction uh, in that. But that's for the, the house to decide at, at a later time. Okay, thank you. I think we will have to leave the questions there. I'm really sorry if we didn't get to um, ask yours. Um, I think we'll just finish by saying that I think everyone who has come tonight is probably leaving knowing a lot more about the House of Lords than they did when they arrived. So thank you so much for coming. And we hope that we can welcome you back to the university again soon, perhaps, um, to answer more questions. No, no. Um, this wasn't Daniel in the Lion's Den. Thank you very much. <laughs> Would you join me in thanking our speaker? Thank you. Thank you.